I'll get that started. And so for anyone, I, I'm sure if you're here, you know of William, but I'm just going to, for the purpose of the recording, I'll do a tiny little introduction that William is the founder of Shared Crossing Project and the director of its research initiative and located in Santa Barbara and the author of this book we're talking about today, At Heaven's Door, What Shared Journeys to the Afterlife Teach Us About Dying Well and Living Better. And this is the March selection for A Year of Reading Dangerously. So that's why I've invited all of you to come here just to ask William your questions. And for a little bit of housekeeping, keeping it will be easiest for me to track your questions if you enter them in the Q&A box so if you go to the bottom bar that you can see and click on Q&A you can type questions in there you can also click raise hand and then I'll see that you have a question you'd like to ask personally and I can unmute you I think I can turn your camera on too but I'm not sure <laughs> and uh, you'll be able to ask your ask William your question yourself so all right so here we are. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm glad you made it on. I'm sorry, William, whatever happened there. So you people, you can go ahead and start typing in questions or raising your hand. And while we're waiting for that, I have a few questions for you, William. I just wanted to ask, you have so many amazing stories in this book from people all over the world. How did you go about gathering all of these stories? You know, that's a question I I get quite a bit. In fact, I still, I remember going to a conference, uh, an IANS conference, and I think it was Bruce Grayson, who as we know is a real scholar in near-death experiences and non-ordinary experiences and what have you. And he said something just really matter of fact. He said, you know, we all know these experiences happen, but how did you get so many cases? We've, but like, we've never really been able to to grab all these cases. Well, one of the things I think that I did differently is I really focused on the shared death experience and I found the patterns. No one had ever really, we knew the features of it, but they didn't really know the typologies or the patterns. So what happened is when I was presenting locally and nationally at different venues is that people identified with the pattern of the experience. And you would, I would literally, here, people come up to me afterwards and say, I didn't even know that I had this until I heard you talk about it and show those videos of people. So it really built quite naturally. And I, I think it's, they're far more ubiquitous than we know. They really are. And I think your, your viewers or your listeners in your book club will be nodding their heads, you know, yeah. at, at, online saying, yeah, yeah. So. Uh I'm sure that's so true. And you mentioned in the book that the people who were able to tell you their stories were grateful because I would imagine there've been people who've been holding on to these stories for years and years, afraid to tell anyone, not sure, like, what was this? What happened? And who, who could I even tell about it? Yeah. Well, you know, Karen, I had my first, uh, which I share in the book, uh, my first real kind of I should say formative. I had another number of other shared death experiences, but I had a really formative one at Zen Hospice where I popped out of my body. I was with Ron and there we are suspended above our bodies communicating. I, as I shared in the book, I talked to my supervisor who I loved and he knew, and he was a real veteran and he just kind of let it go. He didn't so much dismiss it as he just didn't really make much of it. It wasn't for 10 years until I heard Raymond Moody finally talk about it, that the light bulb went off in my mind. And I said, oh, my gosh, this is a thing. And it's a and it's and and it's it's a pattern. You know, it's something that we have as human beings. And that really um, solidified for me that they existed. But I'm sharing this because I, too, didn't know it was uh, a phenomenon that had a label until I heard Raymond Moody identify it. So I'm just carrying his work on basically. Yeah. Well, it, it is, it's something, I mean, it's ancient. I'm sure it's been happening as long as humans have existed. And yet somehow at this current time in our society, we just don't necessarily have the words for it or the, the understanding of it and and we are a little bit afraid of it still i think in general in our society of these experiences i think you're right um and this is something that we talk about quite a bit 
uh, is why has the near-death experience been so well received and and the shared death experience, which is almost the identical experience, really not been that taken up. I mean, my book apparently is making, uh, is really helping that movement for sure. But the near-death experience was different in the sense that it, people survived, no one died. It's got a happy ending. And the shared death experience, somebody dies. And you're there, It's you have a good experience, if you want to call it that, but it's still you're losing a loved one. So I think it ha- it's a bit more off-putting. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. And people are bereaved, you know, and uh, they may not know how to interpret what, what they experience. They know that they may have been in some degree of shock. And yeah. uh, it's something so new to them, the death itself and the level of grief they're experiencing may be so new they don't know what to think about any of that and how to interpret what's happening. I think that's, I think that's true. I think most people who have the SDE will um, say that when they had it, they realize they had something, but then the events of the death uh, surrounding it, whether it was relatives coming in and, and doing the preparations. I mean, there's so many things that happen, as you well know, around death and dying that that experience, if not cultivated and nurtured and identified, can very easily slip into the recesses of our mind. Well, I'm excited that your book is is really helping to inform people, for one thing, empower them to start talking about this. But I'm also excited that death doulas are reading the book and learning about this because they will be, along with hospice workers, they are likely to be there in those moments at the bedside to be able to talk to the family and interpret these situations for the family. I think that's really important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I really trying to get out to more death doulas. Uh, that's one of a big part of our mission is to get this material into people who are at bedside. We've done very well with hospice workers because that's, you know, I work in hospice or I have, and I'm a mental health worker, so I can get to a lot of mental health and spiritual care. But so many uh, death doulas have these beautiful kind of cottage practices, word of mouth, local, just the way it should be, you know, communally based. Um, But it's harder for me to get to them um, or at least get the information to them because I I couldn't agree more that they are the primary deliverers of this message because they can work with the dying in preparation. It's not even hospice workers aren't really brought in till the very end. Death doulas are typically brought in 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 advance, well in Mm -hmm. advance. So yes, I'm with you on that. And they probably spend more time and more intimate time having conversations like this with patients and their families too, so. Yes, agreed. I dropped my paper of questions, so I'm gonna pick it up. (laughs) Um, And well, first of all, let's see. dropping it can't hold on to this so bob hoffman entered a question for you william he says thanks for your ongoing work enjoying the book and signed up for your upcoming class with raymond moody that's great and we'll have to we'll have to talk about that don't let me forget that i want to be as prepared as possible for an sde is there anything i can do in advance to prime myself to have such an experience and that i think a lot of us have that question as well i know about meditation and stillness but would like a more proactive game plan to make myself as open for this type of experience as possible? Great question. Yeah, Bob. And as you just echoed, Karen, it is the primary question. And and actually, when I started the Share Crossing Project in 2013, I started with methods in research, trying trying to develop methods to enable or facilitate the SDE. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound promotional, but this is something that we train people in in our pathway program. So if you're interested, look at our pathway program on our website. Uh, We're not offering it right now. It will be offered next fall. Uh, But in in lieu of that, um, one thing to, to really do is to study the SDE and really get it into your bones. Bob, if you're doing the Raymond Moody course, you will see that we do, um, I lead guided visualizations. 
And I really think those help groove people in a certain way to be receptive to these phenomena. It's like choreographing an SDE. So that's, that's one way to do it. Um, the other thing is, you know, in addition to the meditation practices and any kind of mindfulness practice, if you have the opportunity to be with um, people dying or even people who are ill, attuning to them and what their experience is, is I think the most important thing. There's something about being drawn into allowing yourself to be drawn into relationship with the dying and allowing that energy to connect so that in a certain way, your souls connect or your spirits connect, whatever you want to call that, that connection can then, you know, pull you. I always say, hitch a ride. You kind of hitch a ride with the consciousness of the dying and, and that's a practice. So I know that's not as helpful as you probably like, because the truth of the matter is we don't get a lot of opportunities to practice with the dying. I mean, when we're there, it's game on. Uh, so I would say that in, you know, if you were able to, I would definitely encourage you to look at the pathway program and, uh, and then keep your meditation practice up and then do these guided visualizations you'll do in the Raymond Moody course that I'm doing. Yeah. It's called glimpse beyond the threshold. That that sounds great. And we'll talk before we end this, we're going to we'll give people more information about signing up for that course. Um, Kathleen Valley Stein uh, writes, my impression from reading your book was that some people who are near death are fearful and reticent about passing over the shared death experience comes when those people need help early in the process from a loved one who is at the bedside. Are there other reasons for the SDA other other than a need for help, maybe the person who is passing wants to share it with their loved one. Can it be more inclusive rather than a need for help? Wow, good good question. I haven't really heard that perspective articulated like that because I, I would say that in the SDE, um, you know, the many, the hundreds that I've seen, the dying typically is... Are they more at peace? Are they in need? That is a great question. Well, uh, let me go, let me go at it this way then. Um, first and foremost, we don't know why the SDE happens. We just don't. So I I think there are methods and there are processes that I've already alluded to that you can do to heighten your probability of having one. And one other piece to say here is is to really work out your psychoemotional stuff with people, with the dying. When you're a caregiver or a loved one of the dying, to the extent that you can do your healing, your relationship healing with them, I think that helps. That being said, we do have many cases where the person, as the, as the questioner alluded to, who has some unfinished business with them in a certain way, and maybe not unfinished business, but maybe didn't get enough time with the dying at the end of life, or could be better served by the SDE in terms of a deep connection, in terms of a gift of some sort. Most people refer to these experiences as gifts. So if you look at a number of family members who are, if you would, sounds a little awkward, but who are eligible or most likely to have the SDE, the one who's typically chosen, and I do believe it's some sort of choice here, because while we do see multiple person SDEs, more often than not, we don't see everybody at the bedside or every family member uh, receiving the SDE. And that's a mystery. Why? But we often see if you bring a family together afterwards, as I've done many times in bereavement therapy, the family members will say, well, I really wish I had that SDE, but I'm so glad that my sister Karen got it because Karen was living away from my mom and she hadn't had this many much time with her at the end of life. So I think if my mom was to choose somebody, Karen would be the person I'm using you as an example here, but, okay. um, but that's how, that's how it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's how, that's how I see it is that the person transitioning, by the way, you're here, you might be getting an implicit assumption here. I do think the dying somehow initiates this. It's not to say that the caregiver loved one um, if they're an adept, in other words, if they have a, an ability to attune to this, what I call frequency and can get into that 
SDE, you know, energetics field, if you will, there are adepts. So there are, you know, healthcare workers, hospice workers, doulas as well, I would presume that they've entered into the SDE field a number of times. So they know how to get into it. I'm one of those people. I can, if I'm around to death, I will hear a, a, a frequency change in my ears. I'll feel a hush. My vision gets a little focused. I realize I'm getting drawn into another space, if you will, energetic space. And then the SDE just kind of opens in front of me. And, and I, I know that there are people who are adepts in that way. How, that being said, again, um, I think that the, that the dying do initiate, they do make some choices, and the people they choose are the ones who they feel will benefit most. That, that really makes sense. I could imagine, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if in some families there are jealousies or conflicts over, <laughs> Yeah, you know, mom always liked you best. <laughs> she, I, could, I could imagine that coming up for people. That does come up and, and that's a therapeutic issue. I mean, in grief and bereavement therapy, I, I, I get calls like that and, and, but they're, they're really important to work out. Um, now, I will also say there are a lot of multi-person SDEs. So when you have people, multiple people at the bedside, we do have times when the, the loved ones will have similar experiences, not typically exactly the same, which is interesting too. They'll have different experiences. I mean, some, some overlap, like change, they'll feel a change in the geometry of the room or time-space continuum warps, or the light will be you know, spectacular in some way. But maybe nobody... Only one person feels a deceased relative or only one person sees a spirit guide. Um, all, all those types of things are more um, subjective and individual, it seems like. Yeah, it, uh, the book really points out these, while there are similarities in all these experiences, it's, every story that you tell is unique in so many ways. That's what yeah. makes it so fascinating. Yeah, it is so fascinating. I mean, every time I sit down for an interview, I just... I just tickle myself because I'm like, okay, what am I going to hear today? <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah. And, but now I will say that we, I, I pretty much along with my team have, have crystallized the, the dominant features. We don't have that many surprises in terms of a feature, but the way it manifests and the nuances yeah. uh, and, and the compilation of different features together, that's always fascinating. Yeah, very interesting. Well, Arlene asked, do religions or afterlife belief or non-belief color what is seen in your opinion? Yes, that is the growing edge of our research. Um, and as I'm, as I'm hearing that question from Arlene, I'm thinking of uh, Gregory Sushin, who did, who did this marvelous piece of research, uh, not just you know, across cultures, but even historically in cultures. Uh, about the, about the near-death experience. And he found profound similarities in how the N NDE manifested, but they were culturally derived. So like the, the, the features are, would be similar, but how it expressed itself would be different based on the culture. And we have seen some of that in, in the SDE, but I don't have a, a big enough uh, pool. Of, I have a large pool of, research candidates, you know, a few hundred, but not enough, not enough ethnic diversity. And we're just getting there. Now I will say where we do have ethnic diversity, religion does play a part. Like we have some people um, from the South, some Southern Baptists who kind of got a group of those, those uh, women who were very spiritual and very into their, um, you know, their faith, their Christian faith. And they did have some hints not like Jesus didn't appear, but they had kind of the language they used was what I would put more in the Judeo-Christian um, interpretation of spirit and archangels. Whereas other people might say beings of light, they went right to archangel or, and you know, like that type of thing. So I, my sense is the phenomena is the same, but I think there are ethnic, religious, spiritual uh, overtones that influence how you process that. Hmm. That makes sense. And that one of the things I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that 85% of the people you've interviewed are women, but do you think that men are 
are more reluctant to talk about these experiences and may tend to deny them more than women. I just, I wondered, cause that seems like a societal yeah. thing in a way too, that we don't support men having unique experiences like this. Yeah. I mean, once again, great question. We scratch our heads around this one as well. I think you're, you're right, Karen. There's, there's definitely a cultural piece about men not feeling comfortable or supported or honored if they have these experiences. So two things happen there is they're not as available for them, mm -hmm. for one. They're, so they're not as receptive. They're more, more likely to be dismissive if an SDE kind of begins. They may just kind of push away from it and say, I'm not going there. And then if they have one, I think they're reticent to share. I don't think they see the, the, the gain or the, the positives, if you will, in sharing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that really makes sense to me. So who knows what the future is going to hold with, as you continue this research and maybe as our society gets more comfortable, maybe we'll see more men coming forward and telling their stories too. I, th I think you're, I think you're right. And I will tell you what's interesting is in this course, I'm, you know, again, be teaching with Raymond Moody is that we have a lot more men showing up. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that's, it's because you have two men who are very comfortable talking about this. Um, just wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, um, Teresa Ulrich, Left a, just left a message. Good afternoon from Florida. I'm a hospice RN who has had the privilege and honor of being present with many dying patients. I just became certified as an end of life doula with Suzanne O'Brien's doula givers. Wonderful. I'm so happy to be here with you both today. And this is like the best of both worlds. And we have hospice nurses who get doula training. I think it's wonderful. Plus shared death experience training. That's fantastic. <laughs> And then Connie Chapman writes, a friend died 15 years ago and I had four experiences around his death. Until I heard you and Dr. Moody, I did not recognize these as SDEs, now I do. And since I heard you and Dr. Moody, my friend has visited me twice. Huh. Wow, that's wow. interesting. Have you seen that happen before when someone learns about SDEs? Are they more likely to re have repeated ones? Yeah, that's a... Um... We have found, in fact, I'm going to look at my data on that one because I want to be clear if I can about this. When people have an SDE, I believe they're, you can look on the website of this. If I'm wrong, I believe they're like 67% more likely to have another type of after death communication or, and that would specifically what we track is direct post-death communication that happens soon after a death. I mean, really soon after death. It's usually so soon that it's the type of thing where the departed will be telling the bereaved, um, I think you should see these people this way at my funeral. And I want your eulogy to discuss this. I mean, they're that direct. They said, this is real specific type of after death communication. And then of course there's post-death visions and visitations and all sorts of synchronicities. Uh, now, and this can happen, you know, many years out. It sounds like if this was Connie, 15 years out, that doesn't surprise me. And uh, and oftentimes when some experiences people have had have been validated in the way that they're being validated now, then they come back. So it shows this, what we call mm -hmm. in psychotherapy, the continuing bonds. These relationships continue to uh, beyond human death, you know, and and that's a real beautiful thing for us to know is that when, even though we lose a loved one at the time of their death, the relationship can continue. And it is our responsibility, should we take it on, to receive whatever phenomena in our life that reminds us of them, that we can receive as communication from them and really work at it. So I, I tell, I'll tell you what I really like to do to that, to that caller is if she would be so kind as to submit her case to us, I'd really like that one because I'm very interested in, in positing and asserting that all these experiences, the shared death experience and all these other post-death experiences really offer us an opportunity for an ongoing rich relationship that can be quite meaningful. So I'm collecting that right now for my next book. So for her to submit it, does she just need to go to the Shared Crossing yes. website? Yes, just, just go to, well, you know what she can do? She can write to me at william at sharedcrossing.com. 
Perfect. And just say you heard me on Karen's uh, book club and that'd be great. William at sharedcrossing.com. Perfect. That's great. All right. Bob Hoffman has another question. Uh, he said, I'm hoping that my deceased brother, Ethan, will serve as my spirit guide during my transition. Is it possible at the same time that he's helping me in my transition that he can have an SDE at the same time? Would love to talk with him about this in the next realm. So I'm trying to figure that out. So mm. if he's, if, if his brother, Ethan has died, thank you, Bob, for the question. I'm just, let me, give me a second to figure it out here. And um, so if Ethan has died, he would likely be the person, if uh, hopefully not necessarily though, who would meet you on the other side. In other words, part of the shared death experience is in 51% of our uh, cases, they see the dying. In other words, the dying, the dying appears. So wait a minute, let me say this correctly. Good. Now I'm tracking. I, I, I was stumbled for a bit there. So, Bob, uh, uh, Bob, you're dying. Ethan could be in the greeting party on the other side. That would make sense. So you're wondering, you'd be as you're crossing over, he would be your greeting party. But then you have to give the shared death experience to someone on this side. Does that make sense? Then as Bob's transitioning, he has to he can give this to someone at one of his loved ones. Am I understanding the question or not? So I'm wondering if if um, <clears throat> what Bob means is would Ethan be able to appear to loved ones who are with Bob at that time? Yes. Would Ethan could, Ethan could be part of that shared death experience for Absolutely. them? They could visualize and see Ethan also. Thank you, Karen. You made it simpler than Does I that, did. Well, I hope yeah. that makes that yeah, no, sense. absolutely. I would say yes, absolutely. And that would be um, an intention that Bob would put out to Ethan and say, you know, as I die, you know, our relatives, because they're in the same family, will be here. It would be wonderful if you could be here. And during my passing, that our shared relatives could experience you. Now, this is very interesting, because now what we're talking about is what I call a death vortex or a death portal. Um, what happens when we die is we open a portal and it's energetic. And in that, uh, in that portal, if you will, all sorts of phenomena can, can occur. This is the shared death experience. It's also the near death experience phenomena. So in this case, Ethan could appear to relatives and that would be obviously seeing deceased loved ones appear typically as a greeting party in this case to welcome and greet Bob. But there's all sorts of other phenomena that could happen. Um, as Bob, you die, your relatives could go with you into the afterlife and see the beautiful heavenly realms or um, have share in your past life review. All these you know, features that we see, I encourage people to talk about these, to really say, I talk about what's possible. So, yeah. That's great. Well, th there's a question from Bren Bozeman Seed, and Bren says, hi there, thank you for your work. I am an art therapist and LPC in Virginia, also a telehealth counselor with Oregonians. I've been doing counseling since 2006, and the most powerful work that I love is working with clients facing their own deaths and clients that are grieving a loss. I've been trying to move my work into this realm entirely. My question is about initiating the conversation about end DEs and SDEs with my clients, especially those that, that describe themselves as atheists. I find that my clients who aren't open to the idea that our energy moves on after death truly struggle with the most painful, stuck, and despairing, hopeless grief. Thank you. Well, yeah, I agree with uh, that commentary. I'm sure you would too, Karen, in terms of those who struggle with death uh, as, as, as when they're bereaved, it's because they can't make sense of it and they, they can't put meaning into it. Meaning making in grief and bereavement therapy is the most important aspect of processing a loss. You somehow have to fit it into a context um, that is either something like, this is a natural part of life, uh, everyone has to die. And that works for some, but what really works is if you can put it into a larger context of, well, I know my loved one, departed loved one is alive and well in a benevolent afterlife. Uh, I know that I'll see them again. Uh, death is not to be feared because I had spiritual experiences at the time of death, of which the SDE is one of them. 
All of these are pieces that help uh, with death and dying generally and grief and bereavement as well. But to answer the question specifically, how do you deal with people who are agnostic or atheists? Um, I would stick to the phenomena. I would say that, do you know that there are these phenomena that happen? And there's, as you can, you know, as I laid them out in the, in at heaven's door, there are some real basic phenomena like change in the time space continuum. Well, no one needs to argue with that. There's also the light appears differently. You know, the light shifts all over the place. Um, there are life reviews. We, we know that and quite a, that happens quite a bit. Now, when you start getting into seeing uh, spirit beings and deceased relatives, now you're really rubbing up against a whole uh, cosmology, theology, philosophy about what happens at the end of life. And you're gonna get, you may get some resistance there. But I think it's a good conversation. If you just say, hey, this is just phenomenon. And these happen to people who believe in an afterlife and, and others who don't. I mean, we have a lot of atheists uh, who, and agnostics who say, well, that experience changed my views. I still don't know what happens, but I know it's more mysterious and there are more possibilities than my narrow view particular had originally. So there's an openness, uh, maybe not a switch in transformation in views, but certainly an openness to what could come next. Hmm. That that's a great answer. It's just so good for everyone to hear this because because we probably all know people who don't believe that there could be any sort of afterlife. Those of us who are open to it don't have tr trouble with this information. But just to know, to be able to talk about there are phenomena, there are things that can't be explained, and yeah. they bring comfort to a lot of people. That's, yeah. I think that's great. Well, the, just to follow up on that, um, Karen, maybe to bring in that question of wonder and curiosity. It's like we know these phenomena happen, and you can ask them, what do you make of that? Like, and you can have a conversation about it. I always found this, I mean, if I'm sharing with somebody, so, you know, I work with people and I've seen these experiences, I just find them absolutely spectacular and just beyond anything that I could imagine. What do you make of that? Hmm. Yeah, that's great to ask, yeah. ask it as a question ask like, well, yeah, what do you think of this? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great idea. What, what I also say is, I don't think it's a good option. And I don't think most people who are, reasonable, rational, healthy people will readily dismiss these experiences when you know who, when you know who the people are that are expressing them. And if you, you know, in my book and in our research, most of our candidates are normal people like you and me and the callers here. There's nothing really exceptionally new agey or, you know, not, nothing, nothing, not there's anything the matter with new agey people, but um, because I'm partly in that crowd too, but I'm just saying you can't really write us off as being somehow weird and too far down out of the bell curve for normalcy. I mean, I'm a psychotherapist, very well trained and very resistant to uh, taking, you know, hallucin to believing delusionary thoughts and hallucinatory thoughts. That's not where I go. These experiences happen. They happen in healthy minds and healthy bodies oftentimes in people who are completely unaware of these experiences. These are experiences that we need to listen to and we need to hear the stories of people who share them. We can't discount them. That just doesn't make any sense. And rational people will respect that process. Mm. Yeah, that's a great answer. Well, um, an anonymous person typed in, are there other interventions for a patient who's fearful of dying in addition to preparation for an SDE? Um, that's a, that's a tough thing to answer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think fear of dying is natural and it, it happens. I do think the engagement piece for that is what are you afraid of? Can, can you have a conversation about what are you really afraid of? Is it, is it death itself? Is it the dying process that it's painful? Is it that who you might see or as you go through this, what's your projection? Your, you know, as we say, what is your fantasy about what will happen as you approach death at the moment of death? And if there is an after death, what's your story there? And, and have a healthy, honest, truly inquisitive 
um, and compassionate conversation about that that could begin something like, I see that you're suffering around this and that makes sense. Death is scary. It's a mystery. But I'd love to, I'd really like to be able to, if I can offer anything to you of, of, of comfort or care, can you tell me what it is that you're fearful of? Yeah, that's great. Just having these conversations and yes. opening the door. That's, that's really good. Um, Richard Schneider asks, how are SDEs different from mediumship and have you worked with mediums in your research? Great. So I believe he meant, he meant to say SDEs. How are, S, how are, S, S, how are shared, SDEs? Yeah. SDEs, yeah. Shared okay, I, death experiences. Yes. Great. How are SDEs uh, different from mediumistic experiences? Uh, okay. So, and then he asked about the research. So we typically screen for mediums. If someone calls up and says, I identify as a medium, I'm a medium. I don't typically include them in the research. I think, I think that's just a different category of, of person in a certain sense. I, I love mediums, don't get me wrong. Um, but I'm more interested in people who don't identify in that way. They don't have a, a theory, if you will, for what lies beyond. Not to say that we don't have a lot of people who had a cosmology and believed in an afterlife before they had this experience, but they don't particularly um, suggest that they have a gift for communicating and connecting with uh, the spirit realm, if you will. So th that's my first response. The other response is, well, yes, I would agree with, if I, if I think I'm following the question, that this is a type of mediumistic experience in the sense that you are stretching across the veil into the realm of spirits to, or that, you know, whatever you want to call it, that other dimension to connect with where it appears that we go at when we die. This seems to be a, well, to use the Tibetan word, it seems to be at a minimum a bardo. This is the next transition state that we go into and that mediums suggest that they can connect into these other states, bardos, if you will, that are beyond human death. And that's clearly what the SDE is doing. Uh, so at least it seems to, I can't say clearly, it seems to be that's what the SDE is doing because the experiencers report that they are sharing in the journey, in the transition from this life into uh, an afterlife, what comes after human death. Okay, that's, that's a good, good explanation. Um, Lynn Ann McGrail asks about dreams. So she says, the day after my brother died, I dreamt that he floated down to earth in our backyard. He spoke to me telling me how beautiful it is where he is and said that he's okay. He gave me a hug. I felt so much joy for him. It all felt so real. I woke up and ran to the window to see if he was there and he wasn't. Is this considered an SDE? Great question. It, I, let me just, I, I missed one detail. Did she say this happened the day after he died? or The day the, after he died. Okay. So um, this could very well be an SDE. The reason why is because the pattern is the same. Now, we have to get into the pattern. So let me help with this. So it, when we look at these, so what we're trying to do is distinguish between whether this was a shared death experience or whether this was a post-death vision or visitation. That's what we're trying. And once again, honestly, maybe the distinction isn't that important for me. It's like, they're all beautiful, lovely experiences, but you know, we're researchers and we're trying to help people have handles and your caller asked about this. So let's go into it. So if, if the person who crossed over was seemingly in transit, journeying still, moving upwards, heading towards the light. If there was a sense that the deceased was in progression on this journey, then it feel, then in my definition, that's gonna be more of an SDE. But if that person seems to be coming back from another place, in other words, seems to be in another realm and is visiting to get the caller's attention uh, and deliver a message, 
then that would be a post-death vision of visitation. So it really has to do with, in, in my working with these typologies, is if that person, if the SDE experiencer is invited into the transition and kind of observing movement towards the next destination, SDE, if that, vis if that visitation or if that person, the deceased, is coming to them in the opposite direction, uh, to deliver something that's a shared that's a uh, post-death vision or visitation mm. that makes sense i was going to ask you that very same question about dreams so that really makes sense um sandy doyle asks for those of us who have not experienced an sde is there anything we can do to foster a more palpable connection with our closest loved ones who have already died yeah this is always a choice um, and it's one that should be done with intention, because the first step I always ask people is, what are you seeking? What are you desiring in your relationship with that person on the other side? Like you're going to you, you want to make contact, you want to um, have communication with them. OK, be clear about what you're asking for and what you're wanting. That's the first step. And then there are a variety of ways to connect. Um, if you're trying to do this or intend to do this on your own, then that's a meditation prayer practice. You can place the intention in a very mindful, loving way to have a message or a contact or a sign. And I would ask for a particular sign. I would say, I often work with people, I used to do groups on this, you know, um, Imagine yourself going to bed at night or do this as a practice before you go to bed at night, get down on your knees, just or do it, get a posture that's reverent and uh, focused. It, it singles to yourself somatically and any other beings are observing that you are making, you're taking a deliberate ritual to initiate contact with somebody on the other side, get in that posture, clear your mind, do your spiritual practices, whatever they are, and place that attention to that person. I would like to have a communication with you. I'd like to have contact with you. Can you please do that to me? Come to me in my dreams or come to me in some other way. Ask for a sign. If there was something you guys used to do together or something you shared with that person, ask for that to happen. Maybe it's something like, you know, some people ask for feathers to appear or you know, whatever it is, like walk on the beach. I live in Santa Barbara. Some people say, show me a, a sign, a mammalian sign a display of dolphins jumping or whales appearing or whatever it is. Ask for a sign that you will recognize. And you can put the sign out there that you want. But, but do that, uh, do that uh, prayer, if you will, that ritual request five nights in a row at least and see what you get. Stick with it. It's not a one and done. It's a practice. These are practices to connect. And then once you get a sign, now you've started a relationship and now you have a dialogue and then you continue uh, to dialogue and, and place your needs and wants. I hope that's helpful. That, that sounds really helpful, at least for me listening in. So um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um, I don't know if, if anyone else, I, there was a hand raised, but it went back down again. So if anyone has wants to raise a hand right now, you can. But I'll, otherwise, I have here's another question for me to read uh, from EP. When my mother was in the ICU and transitioned, I had a strange feeling or sense as if I saw her going from the bed, as if feet first toward the end of the bed, almost slipping into another space. I recall it as almost visual, though I don't know that I saw it happen that way. But she slipped off and I felt a sense of relief and as if I'd go there too when I was ready. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's the feature of what we call spirit leaving body. And what your, what that caller, EP, <laughs> um, described is something we see quite a bit. So that, and that, that sense of, see if she gets this, that translucent sense of maybe even body form, but not necessarily a little wispy, could be a little um, hazy even. Uh, even like a mist, Raymond Moody calls it a mist at death. Uh, 
even ghostly a little bit, but the fact that it, it slides off of or out of the body is something we see. It tends to be a little deliberate. It's not rapid. It, it can often look like it's taking a little bit of effort, um, but not always. It can be smooth, you know, lifting off. Uh, honestly, we don't see this happening too much going out of the feet. We have a couple of cases like that. Most of the cases, it, the, the, this, we call it the translucent spirit, if you will, uh, leaves out of the chest or out of the crown and heads up. Uh, so, but I have heard this one coming out of the feet. So it, I would say that's a very well-known feature in the shared death experience. And let's see, that was Ellen asking the question, but now uh, I'm going to unmute you, Ellen, because she want, I think she wants to ask something more here. So, oh, so. great. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I didn't really ask. Can you hear me? Yes. So yeah, it was it was just so weird because I'm not religious and I didn't anticipate this. And she was in the ICU and they had taken her off some of the supports. We asked her to them to keep her on a little longer so my dad could get there. And I was with her and I was up all night. Maybe I was a little delusional. <laughs> but anyway, I knew it was coming and uh, my dad didn't get a chance to get there in time. And but it was as if like, almost like lying there as if almost being carried away by a toboggan. It, I want to call it like carried away. Like it wasn't that, I don't know. It was just so weird. It, and it was just something I've mentioned a couple of times because I didn't know who to talk to about it. And I just, I was listening to what you were saying. And I thought it was, it was as if she sl was taken away, but her body was into, it wasn't like she lifted away or flew away. It was just her body resting in the same position went in that direction. There was a sense that that happened almost visually, but I can't say that it was something I saw happen, if that clarifies it. Yeah, I mean, I like the way you're um, describing this with a bit of hesitancy, because mm -hmm. that's the way we get the reports, is it's, you're looking in, Ellen, into another realm that doesn't have the same sensory clarity that we have in the human realm, so it's not concrete. So what you're saying, is something that I've heard, you know, many hundreds of times, this kind of trying to find the words for it, not exactly sure what you saw or experienced. And yet it left a very clear impression on you that something profound happened. And the, what you describe is this, this, like this sliding away, if you will, slipping away of, of, you know, I think you, it's like on a toboggan is the term you use. Right. Yeah. Which, carried away. Which, yeah. Yeah. And carried away. And, and, that, and that's also something we, we see is that there's some sort of um, sense that the spirit is being coaxed or supported out of the human body uh, and guided and assisted and helped. So it's kind of a, a slowish process. It's typically not rapid. It's a little bit deliberate. And then when it gets further away from the body, it, it can pick up a little bit of velocity, not a whole lot because it typically stays in the room for a little bit too, based on our observations. Now, that being said, we would only know if it stayed in the room because people are reporting that. Maybe they, they leave most of the time and they don't have the experience. But uh, what you're describing sounds like this feature, spirit leaving body, and it makes sense. I would, I would affirm you 100%. It's fascinating. Yeah, and I'll just say the angle, like if I were to say the angle, it was almost flat and slightly up and then i don't know it's kind of disappeared because we were in an ic icu room but it wasn't up or at a hugely you know 45 degree angle it's just yeah thank you i, I was just listening and i thought this kind of sounds like what i experienced yeah i'm so glad that you shared because this is the way we um learn about these experiences because you know, when you hear me talk or someone else who's familiar with these experiences, it, it does awaken our and jar our memories of these experiences. And that's how we know that this experience is real. I mean, that's because we don't have it in our cultural kind of, um, you know, lexicon, if you will. It's not an experience that's well known. But increasingly, as we share these stories, as you've just done today, Ellen, more and more people will say, hey, wait a minute, this person, Ellen, who I know really well, and she's really, you know, normal. She had this experience. So, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I That reminded me, I wanted to ask you if are these experiences from your research more likely to happen with, for people who die in the hospital or who die at home? Or does that make any difference? 
Yeah, great question. Again, 64% uh, of our accounts happen remotely. In other words, the person having the experience will not even be at bedside. Okay, so then that goes to the next question. Does it happen more in the hospital or more at home? And we tend to think that they happen more in settings. I shouldn't say we tend to think. We see that they happen more in, uh, in, in a home setting. That's not to say they don't happen in hospitals. We have many cases where they happen in hospitals, but tend to be more in the comfort of your own home, less interferences, less you know, medical procedures to uh, maybe interrupt the frequency, if you will, or interrupt this, this process of transition. Uh, more, more times, that when you're in those places, there is more opportunity for you to break your connection or your trance with, I'd say trance, but you know, it doesn't have to be, that's a little bit of a strong term. Break your connection with the dying. If you're sitting vigil, you want to be in sharing the field with them. And if you have a lot of medical personnel around, I mean, they're doing good work. They're doing what they're supposed to do, but it's not helpful for the SDE. And um, that's that also goes along with, I, I have concerns about my colleagues, medical doctors who are not very open to this type of phenomena. It seems to me, I know some are, but anyway, concerns. We have, we have a lot of educating to do yeah. in those medical spaces because we could make those spaces more conducive to this kind of experience if we chose to, but. I think so, yeah. Um, Jamie, writes my husband's death i saw a golden light that night 12 hours later i've never seen that color ever before such peace filled me a knowing all was well and it lasted for about one minute so that that's interesting a golden light of a unique color well that's one of the features is light i mean certainly in the near-death experience light is the dominant feature in 75 percent of the cases and it's that movement towards this luminous light in the SDE, the light appears in a variety of different ways. One is similar to the NDE, where the experiencer will see that beautiful luminous light up in the distance and know that their, their departing loved one is heading in that direction. And they may be accompanying them with them part of the way. But there's also we also see light serving as bridges or, or conduits of transportation. So we'll see cylinders of light that the dying travel up or escalators of light. We see a lot of light coming down in a certain way, serving as a bridge to whatever lies beyond or connecting with that great light. Uh, so th that would, that's, I would love to hear uh, that person's case because we like collecting the light cases. They're just so beautiful and they're usually pretty clear cut. So. Mm. So Jamie, email William. Yes, please do. <laughs> William at sharedcrossing.com. William at sharedcrossing.com. Okay. And then Kathleen, I, I'm just keeping going with these questions here. I Great. know we're getting close to the end of our hour, but Kathleen says, do you think there will ever come a time when SDEs will become part of mainstream conversation or will it always remain taboo because it has to do with death? That's a great question. And I, I foresee a time when people really embrace these shared death experiences. You know, in Santa Barbara, where I've been for, you know, over a decade now, I had a really lovely story shared with me yesterday. Uh, it's just yesterday, in fact. One of my good friends went to a funeral uh, in a nearby town, Goleta. If you know Santa Barbara, it's a town just north of us. And he was at the funeral and, and it, was, it had been raining just a bit. And then there was a rainbow that came down and landed right on the, uh, the, the, the funeral procession. In other words, right where they were bringing the, the casket in. And he said, everybody saw it, or at least enough people saw it. And they said, did you see that? And then people are saying, that's a shared crossing. That's a shared crossing. We just saw a shared crossing. So, I mean, granted, in my town, um, if enough, a few people know me and, and that language is out there and I've written about it and lectured about it. And now it's in scholarly you know, journals and such. So I do believe that really warmed my heart that the, the joy, what really moved me is not so much that they identified a shared crossing. It's good that they did. But when they did identify the shared crossing, they did it with joy. They said, oh, my gosh, we were gifted with something. They weren't looking at it like saying a rainbow is coming down. I don't want to talk about it. This could be weird. If I mention a rainbow, people are going to think I'm crazy. No, they said 
Did you see the rainbow? That's a shared crossing. This is what we know happens. These events happen. And it's communication across the veil. We have been given a gift. Let's celebrate the gift of our now departed loved one who just gave us this. That's what I hope for. So Santa Barbara may be the epicenter, but it's spreading out. <laughs> it and conversations like this are, are a big part of that. Yeah. Well, um, I hope you could take a couple more questions. Sure. But I'm happy to do it. Uh, Lynn writes, when my brother-in-law was dying at home, there were many unexplained electrical situations. We were told that this was my brother-in-law communicating. Do you have a comment? Yes. And um, these electrical experiences, whether it's lights flickering or uh, digital um, uh, items like clocks and what have you, freezing at certain times or blinking, uh, music coming on as well is also another energetic electrical um, phenomena. These are well known and well studied to be happening around death and even post-death as well. So that I would definitely affirm that. And somebody who's done a lot of research on this is Dr. Peter Fennick in the UK. He studied, he did a huge study on, they call, in the UK, they call caregivers carers. But anyway, he did a great article on the, I think it was the Journal of Gerontology and Geriatrics. And he talked a lot about these, uh, what he calls um, death bed coincidences. And a lot of them have these energetic electrical features associated with which your caller just identified. So that's a big affirmation. We study those too. We call them, um, you know, uh, shared crossing synchronicities, shared crossing synchronicities. And we see them throughout. The electrical ones can happen mostly at death, around death, but they happen afterwards too. All right. And then uh, one more question. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe a couple. Karen Bullard asks, the day after my father-in-law passed 10 years ago, I had some sort of visit where I had a very somatic experience where I felt my body vibrating and what I can only describe as a burst of love into my heart chakra, where I felt ext extreme peace followed by a somewhat frightening life review of my own. As wow. I had a meditation practice, I used my breathing practice to stay present and I'm not sure how long passed before I woke up. So this was the day after her father-in-law yeah. died. Yeah, beautiful. So um, the life review she talked about, there are three types of life reviews in the shared death experience. There's a life review where you, sh you sh kind of see a movie in some way. I don't, I'm curious if you're, if the caller um, talked about how she saw it, like, did you see it as a movie or see it as slide snippets of some types of photos, memories coming through in terms of still photos, or if it was actually live video, so to speak, like just rolling scenes. All of those are common in the shared death experience. There are three types though. You can see, a, I'll use a movie, if you will, a life review movie of your life together with the dying. That's one type, you together with the dying or their life, not you, just the dying's life that you see reviewing their entire life. Or the third type, which is what the caller just referred to, a life review of your own. For some reason, you have entered into a space that's allowing you to have a review of your life. I find that one absolutely spectacular. And that is research that, um, that is a finding that our research uh, discovered actually, because when I first saw, start seeing these, I go, wait a minute, I've never heard of these. And now we have probably, you know, at least a 10 and, and it's spectacular. So I would, I would, I would love if that particular person would reach out to me as well, because we are very interested in studying that, that particular experience. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That's William at sharedcrossing.com. <laughs> I get so excited about that one because that's one that's just really in the last couple of years we've discovered. Wow. Great. Wow. You've got some, got some new, hey. <laughs> new stories. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm excited. <laughs> well, um, Bren, who wrote before, this is kind of the perfect question to end on because we can segue into talking about the workshop you're offering. But Bren says, how do you recommend finding community, both professionally and personally, around these experiences and supporting people during their own and their loved ones' transitions? So I was thinking maybe through your course or through your website, yeah. is there a chance for community there? Yeah. 
So this is a great question. So I am doing the course right now with Raymond Moody. It just started and it's basically is a self-study. And then there's three Q and A's that Raymond and I will do together. This course is wonderful to learn about the features of the shared death experience, but it's not a big community building course the way we designed it. However, I am starting another course in end of April. And there's actually, uh, to learn a little bit more about that, there'll be a webinar on, uh, on April 7th. I'm just kind of thinking about April 7th. But this course is designed for group work. It's online. It's seven 90-minute sessions. There'll be an in-depth study or presentations about the different types of SDEs we see. Of course, the features, the conditions that cause them. And like I said, the, the various typologies, which are fascinating, which we haven't even touched on today. I do a little bit of that in the book. I do, I do a fair amount in the book, but we'll go really into the different ways you can experience it. And what I like about it is we're going to have a community component. We'll be doing group work, processing, sharing stories, listening to each other, having engaging questions for people to ask so that they can learn, share their own story, but learn from others. And you don't have to have an SDE to have it. You just, have, but if you want it, if you're curious, this is a way to build community. And we think this is going to launch some groups as well from the Share Crossing Project. Really, what part of our mission is, you know, we to raise awareness and, about these experiences and to transform people's relationship to death and dying. But a big piece of this is also community engagement around these. So this is the part of our mission, and we will be doing that. So stay in touch. And uh, I would really encourage you, if, she, if possible, to do that next group. I think it's called Awakening to the Transformational Power of the Shared Death Experience. So William, do you have um, do you have a newsletter? Like, can people sign up on your website yeah. so they can get notified about things? And then do you have a Facebook group or anything? We have Facebook. We don't have a, we do have a Facebook group. It's yeah, it's Share Crossing Project. And we're active on that. We also have Instagram as well and Twitter. Um, so yes, we're on that. But a good way is just, we do send out our newsletters. And right now, since the book launch, we've had so much going on. Like we'll put your interview out, Karen's, for people to, to listen to as well. And so we're just doing so much community awareness work. That, yeah. And the newsletter has all that in it. And our website, by the way, if you go to our website, we have a story library where you can see firsthand accounts, video narratives of shared crossing experiences. And they're spectacular. You'll get to hear you know, people tell their own stories. So yeah. Now, and that's a good way to be in touch with us. Yeah, fantastic. And someone asked me to to mention the name of the book again, so mm. I will, At Heaven's Door, if I can get the lighting right, so you can read yeah. it, At Heaven's Door by William J. Peters. And I know you, people can get it probably at any any bookstore, on Amazon, yeah. anywhere, wherever you're used to buying books. Absolutely. And I always encourage people to shop locally if you can. Uh, just is so great to keep the local booksellers in business. Um, because during the COVID, they've had a tough time keeping their doors open. So, but get, you can get it anywhere. I'm blessed that Simon & Schuster is the publisher. So they're pretty well, they have a good distribution network. That's great. Well, uh, William, this has been so much fun. We had so many amazing questions that came yeah. in. And uh, I appreciate you giving us your time like this. It's it's such a valuable topic. And it's obviously growing. And the interest is growing all over. So yeah, I mean, I'm just thankful that you selected uh, my book, uh, Karen. It's just a pleasure to be with you and your community. I know you're doing just amazing work. So thank you for allowing me to, to share what I know with your community. Well, you're very welcome. And there have been just dozens of thank yous typed in here in the chat box, too, for all of your great answers for everyone's questions. So thank great. you so much for your time again, William. Thanks, everyone who joined thank you. us and tuned in. I'm turning off the recording now and then